we are sauntering in 1 Corinthians and we are on a big chapter again today. Big chapter yesterday, big chapter today, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Good morning, Cathy. And uh, so let's pray and ask the Lord to help us because we're going to need some help today. Good morning, Pete. Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you that you breathe this word into the heart of the Apostle Paul as he put pen to paper. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to interpret it to us and make it speak to our hearts today in Jesus name. We want to surrender our hearts to you and allow your word to speak to us. Amen. Good morning, Ruth and Alison and Chris, if you're there and Sky. Great to see you. Um, so here we go. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to, tr to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So, if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those? Sorry, why why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Wow. So Paul is picking up on something that's going on in the, in the Corinthian church where people are falling out with each other and they're defrauding each other, they're lying, they're stealing, they're cheating from each other. And then they're going to court to sort, to sort it out. And he's saying, listen, you guys should be able to sort these things out among yourselves without going to unbelievers to act as a judge between you. He's saying, come on, what's the matter with you? Don't you know that you're going to judge the world? And don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Well, <laughs> I guess they didn't. And to be really honest, we don't get much insight anywhere else in the Bible as to what this might even mean or what context we would be judging the world or angels in. But Paul's saying your destiny is so much higher than this. And yet you can't even solve these tiny little disputes between brothers and, and and it's going back to what we were talking about before where Paul was saying you I want to treat you as mature but you're immature I, I wanted to feed you some solid food but you still need meat you still need to be taught how to play nice with each other good morning Pete and Flor buenos dias um, and he's saying you still need someone on playground duty to kind of help you play nice and share your toys and stuff and he says this is this is really a classic illustration of the immaturity that Paul's talking about and he's saying your destiny as a believer as a child of God is so much greater than what you've become and what you've allowed and he said you know it's he says you should be able to judge these trivial cases. Now, Jesus gave us very good instruction, didn't he, in Matthew 18? He said, if your brother sins against you, go to him, just the two of you, and talk about it face to face. Don't, let <laughs> me say this in modern parlance, don't send a text and say, I'm really annoyed with you because it, a phone call is kind of better but face to face is even better emails are are terrible it's a terrible way to to sort issues out and texts are terrible talk to the person face to face and and uh, jesus said go to the person go to the brother and have the conversation if it doesn't work take someone along with you and have a witness there and say come on let's sort this out 
If that doesn't work, he says, go to the, take the, you know, some bring it to the church somehow. I don't know, how, you know, maybe the leaders of the church or something or a group of people from church to say, come on, let's sort this out. We can get there. Let's, we're a family. Let's sort this stuff out. And he's using the language of family. He's saying, you know, brothers, gosh, brothers and sisters, we should not be taking each other to court. Now, it does happen, doesn't it? It does happen out there in the world that families are divided and they go to law about it. This is a really sad thing. And he's saying to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. He's saying you have failed to live up to what Jesus has in store for you as one of his children. And he says, and this is a really, really difficult one for many, perhaps. He says, verse seven, he says, wouldn't it be better just to take the hit? Wouldn't it be better just to suffer the wrong rather than have the, the sort of, uh, I don't know, the defeat of going to court to, against a brother or sister in the Lord and he says, you know, it, to, I think in the eyes of Paul, it's like you're, you're setting yourself up for ridicule. You're bringing the gospel into disrepute and dishonour, bringing the message of Jesus into dishonour. You should be able to get these things sorted out um, better than that. And then he goes on. So that's that's a really important thought. And, and I love the, just the statement. Wouldn't it be better to take the hit? Wouldn't it be better to suffer wrong? rather than have everything sorted out if if it's not if it, you can't get there just say well look I forgive you you owe me nothing I release you from the debt even if you don't think you owe it to me do you know what I mean and and let's be the bigger person let's trust in the Lord to exonerate us in the end and he's the best one to fight for us isn't he right let's move on or so we'll spend all morning on that he says nine verse nine or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, this is really, really important. I want to listen closely because this is the this scripture is a battleground currently in the church at large in the world. Right. OK. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So he's saying it's, this is an incompatibility, incompatibility issue. The unrighteous, the person who has not repented of their sins, has not come to Jesus and bowed the knee before Jesus, that person will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't receive all of the promises and blessings of God in this life or the life to come. OK, verse. So he says, do not be deceived, neither. So if he's saying do not be deceived, that means it's probable or possible that you might be deceived on this subject. So do not be deceived. It's like when God says be strong and courageous to Joshua is because Joshua was terrified. So if Paul is saying do not be deceived, it probably means that some are being deceived and it's possible that we might. So he's saying do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexual, homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, if you don't know what unrighteous looks like, let me give you a list. And he goes through this list. Now, there is a big debate at the moment within the church as to whether homosexuality is a sin or not. Now, what Paul does here, he says those who practice, men who practice homosexuality. And the word there he uses is two words. There's, there's malakos, which is it means soft and effeminate and is often referred to as the sort of um, the guy who's kind of more soft and, well, effeminate, I guess, and therefore um, attractive to other men, possibly. But it's also used in connection with um, the sale of sexual favours from a guy to a guy. 
Um, but he also uses the word arsenokoites, which is two words, which means to go to bed with a man. So he says, so this is where we're talking about practicing homosexuality. He's talking about those who go to bed with a man. Now, koite, that koites, that whole kind of concept is to do with sex and the marriage bed and so on. And so the implication strongly in there is someone who goes to bed with a man to have sex with him, another man who goes to bed with a man to have sex with him. So Paul is being quite explicit here. He's taking two um, concepts and bringing them together. And but there's been a lot of debate as to whether this is this applies to people who are in a long term loving sexual homosexual relationship or whether this is men who practice prostitution um, and sell themselves for money or men who sleep with young boys, hence the soft and whatnot. But in, I think what, what really what we're doing there is we're looking to split hairs over the meaning of something that's pretty clear. And it would certainly have been understood by Paul's listeners. Now, let me just say this as well. At the time Paul was writing, homosexuality was very, very commonplace. Nero, um, I don't know if he was emperor at the actual time Paul's writing this, but Nero had a guy castrated who he married. And then Nero married somebody else and became this guy's wife. You know, so it was very, it was very kind of talked about and public and people were very familiar with these terms, this idea that Paul's talking about. But the thing is that people pick on this verse to argue the toss about homosexuality. But look what else is listed. The sexually immoral. And the word there actually is a word that can be used for somebody who is out there having sex without being married or... Um, uh, to the person they're having sex with or multiple people fornication is the kind of posh word for it um and the um it also can can be used to refer to a male prostitute as well so but he says the sexually immoral nor idolaters people who worship idols of all sorts that's a broad term there's a whole host of idolatry possible isn't there adulterers that's someone who sleeps with someone else's spouse somebody who breaks into a marriage situation and starts having sex with one of that couple that is adultery he's saying this is the same he's putting these all in the same category and then he then he says thieves now that includes people who pickpocket on the underground but it's also people who commit white collar fraud and who drive a big flashy car and wear a lovely suit to work those kinds of people he says they're thieves that uh, um the greedy drunkards listen to me <laughs> are you a drunkard serious nor revilers people who are constantly taking ridicule in other people constantly pulling people down reviling them swindlers people who deceive people out of money he says they won't inherit the kingdom of god so he's not singling out homosexual um People who practice homosexuality, and I do think there's a difference between having a same-sex attraction and practicing homosexuality. Just, just going to not get into that, but I just think there is a difference. Um, and he says, you know, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the here's the kicker. This is the important bit. Paul says, and so were some of you, but. Let me say that again. So were some of you. The people I'm writing to, says Paul, you guys, many of you, were living this kind of lifestyle in some shape or form or other. So you were adulterers, sexually immoral, homosexual, swindlers, greedy, all the rest of it. You were doing that stuff. But, and here's the but, such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our 
God. So Paul is saying, listen, you guys used to be precisely like this. This used, this would have described you prior to your encounter with Jesus. But when you met Jesus, you were washed. <laughs> you were washed. What's he saying? You were dirty before. <laughs> you were dirty before. Now you're clean. Jesus has washed you. You were sanctified what does that mean you were made holy you were set apart you were your dirty clothes was taken off you you are put in nice clean clothes and then you could enter into the presence of God wow you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God justified it means as if you never did it it's like you're you don't have to try and justify yourself anymore and here's the thing, what, what there are many people today who want the pastors to say, it is okay for you to live like this. It's okay for you to live together with your partner before you're married. And that's fine. That's what they want. That's what, there, there's a huge amount of pressure on pastors to soften the line and say, oh, you know what, it's okay. It's okay. Let's embrace the rainbow. Yeah, hurrah. The person who is in this way of life needs to, whatever that may be, whatever that in that list or cat categories that Paul's listed there, we need to come to Jesus and be washed. We need to stop. It's about repenting and being changed. And, and Paul says, you were washed. You were sanctified, you were made holy, you became a priest, you were set apart for God to be his own personal possession. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, that is the whole thing. So you've received the Spirit of God, you've been changed, you've been transformed. <laughs> God did not send Jesus into the world to save, uh, to allow the world to continue in sin, but to save us from our sin, the Bible says. Right, okay. Now let's move on and we'll get some context and we'll understand some more if we read it. Verse 12, it says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will be, not be enslaved by anything. This is a, that's an interesting and kind of tricky one to juggle with because we're trying to get inside what Paul is actually trying to say. And now he goes on and he says, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy one and the other. So what he's he's like, he's quoting somebody and he's saying all things are lawful for me. It's, it's like because I'm a new creation, then, you know, I don't, God, I'm justified, therefore, it, it, he's, and he's saying, no, actually, I, these things can enslave me, and I'm not going to be enslaved by them. He says, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be enslaved by food. He said, food is meant for the stomach, but the stomach, um, and the stomach for food but God will destroy one and the other and I think what he's trying to say here is don't become so preoccupied thank you Kathy yes, don't, don't be so preoccupied with food that it masters you now we know all about that don't we it can be that we can't stop eating because we have become obsessed by it that way or then there is the other extreme where we don't eat anything because we're obsessed by it that way. And so the the preoccupation with food has mastered us. It's controlling us. And these things are so powerful, as I personally know. They're desperately powerful. And yet Paul is saying, do not let these things rule your life. Do not let these things govern you. And then he goes on to say, and this is really important, he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Now we're going to understand something about what how Paul sees the human body. Now the Greek thinking, which he's 
he's addressing. He's in the middle of Greek culture here, or he's writing to people who are steeped in Greek culture. There were two kind of schools of thought. One was that the the the, the um, body was irrelevant because it was the spirit that was important, and they they or at least they these people thought it didn't matter what you did to your body you could stuff it full of food in fact it was the same school of thought but they both had different approaches to it so they thought that the body was inferior and irrelevant and the spirit is what was important and so they would say it doesn't matter what you do with your body you can go out and have sex with as many people as you want get drunk all the time eat loads of food and just live it up because it doesn't matter because your spirit is what really matters so that was one school of thought and they were the Epicureans and the other school of thought. Um, Pete would do a better job of this than me, but the other school of thought were, were the Stoics and they said, oh, you know, we have to suppress the desires and all the rest of it of our body because it's only the spirit that's important. And so we need to subjugate that and keep it down and all the rest of it. So he's saying, no, listen, you're missing it. This Greek philosophy is rubbish. It's it's missing a really, really important point. And he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And my body doesn't exist for food. Food helps it to exist so that it can be here as a temple for the Lord. Right, let's go on and we'll we'll just read on through. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. This is really important. The Lord has designs on my body. So when I give my life to Jesus, he takes my body too. He wants this, this architecture of flesh. He wants that to be his dwelling place where he lives by his spirit. So the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now he's talking there about the resurrection that happened to Jesus when Jesus was boom out of the tomb. And the same thing he says will happen to us, that we will be resurrected in the on the last day and we will be with him forever. Our bodies, that is. He will raise us up by his power. Now lots of people have wondered how that could possibly happen because bodies decompose and some are cremated and they go into a zillion ashes and they get scattered in the sea. It's a miracle, isn't it? If it's going to be raised up at all, it's going to be a miracle. It's not going to be a big problem to God to find all the bits. And plus it's a new body anyway, but it's like God wants our bodies. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me keep going before we run out of time. The body is not meant for... Oh, we've read that a hundred times. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. That means it's a miracle. It's supernatural. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Wow. When he's talking about members there, he's talking about like digits or limbs. He's saying your body is like Jesus's little finger or Jesus's arm. Your body is part of his body. It makes up his body. He talks about this a lot in different bits of the New Testament. So he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That is the anointed one. Your bodies are members of the anointed one. They're digits, they're limbs of the anointed one. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her. Wow, now he's talking about sex. When a man enters a, the body of a woman in sex, they become one flesh together. And he's saying, doing that with a prostitute? Seriously, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, and we get to that in a second. Let me read it on. Let me read on. He says, do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her for it is written the two become one flesh but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him flee from sexual immorality 
Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body or into it. You could possibly translate that. His own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Oh, that's news, isn't it? To some of us, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That is incredible. What Paul's saying is, listen, do you not understand when a man and a woman come together to have sexual intercourse, they become one flesh. And he says, don't go out there and squander that and disregard what's really happening when you lie with another woman who's not your wife. He says, you're, you're bringing you, you, the temple of God, the temple of this holy place, reserved for his holy presence, the holy presence of his spirit. Are you saying you're going to just go and join that on to some random person that you have no... He says, come on. And so we understand that marriage is a covenant. It's given to us by God. It's a covenant between a man and a woman. And God is the third person in that covenant. So God is very happy when a man and a woman who are married to each other make love and are one flesh together. He's like, yeah, this is what's meant to happen. This is how it's meant to be. But And so that's not a violation of the temple. But when we just go out and... Oh, sleep, you know, sleep around or we it, it's like we we cannot do this. We cannot become one flesh with all these different people and still be a holy temple to God. For God. And so he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And then he says this really, really, really important statement that possibly isn't preached enough in fact I don't think I've heard it preached very much at all and that is that you are not your own you are not your own when you come to Jesus and surrender your life to him you are not your own so this is his kind of sucker punch right at the end he says this is what this whole thing is about this is what the thing about lawsuits is about you're not your own you're not your own you're not a private individual you belong to somebody. And when he talks about the unrighteous inheriting the kingdom of God and all the different things that people try to justify and try to deceive you into thinking are OK, he says, no, you're not your own. Everybody who comes to Jesus has to change. We have to change if we're in an adulterous relationship. We have to change if we're going around lusting after everybody on the street. We have to change if we're stealing. We have to change if we're in a homosexual relationship. We have to change if we're defrauding our company at work or the public or just going out and getting slaughtered at the weekend. We need to change. That stuff has to change. Why? Because when we give our lives over to Jesus, we're not our own anymore. We belong to somebody who's bought us with a price. And when we accept his gift of salvation and we receive him into our hearts, our body becomes a temple where he dwells by his spirit. Now, I don't know <laughs> if that has made sense to you this morning, but I'm going to pray that God works that word into our hearts and it becomes revelatory to us. So Holy Spirit, thank you for being with us today. Speak to us and work your word into our hearts and shape us and change us. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone.